In this video, we're going to identify the symmetry operations that can be found within a molecule. If you'll recall from the previous video, the symmetry operation is a geometric transformation that we can perform on an object that leaves it unchanged. So for example, if I have a star and I tell you to turn around and then I perform a symmetry operation on that star, you would not be able to tell whether or not I had performed that symmetry operation because it looks identical to what I started with. For our purposes, there are five basic types of symmetry operations that we're going to be discussing. The first is called identity. This is symbolized with an E, and it's the operation that occurs when you do nothing to an object. Every single object has the identity operation. Another symmetry operation is a counterclockwise rotation about an axis by pi 2 pi over n radians. We symbolize this with the symbol C subscript n, where n is what you're dividing 2 pi by. A third type of symmetry operation is a reflection through a mirror plane. There are three types of mirror planes that depend on how that plane is oriented relative to different rotational axes within the molecule. If the mirror plane is perpendicular to something called the primary CN rotational axis, which we'll be defining in a few minutes here, it's called a sigma H for a horizontal mirror plane. If that mirror plane contains the primary rotational axis, it's called a sigma v for a vertical mirror plane. If that mirror plane is a vertical mirror plane that reflects a dihedral plane, then we call it a sigma d for a dihedral mirror plane. A fourth symmetry operation is an inversion through a point. This is symbolized with a lowercase i, and what this inversion operation does is it takes all points x, y, z on a Cartesian axis system and converts them to negative x, negative y, and negative z. The fifth type of symmetry operation is something that's a little bit difficult to see in most molecules. It's called a counterclockwise improper rotation about an axis by 2 pi over n. This is symbolized with the symbol S subscript N. And what this rotation does is it does a proper counterclockwise CN rotation and then reflects the points through a horizontal mirror plane. So the mirror plane that's perpendicular to that primary CN. What we're now going to do is go through and explore all of these different symmetry operations, and we're going to use two molecules as our primary example. We're going to use square planar platinum tetrachloride and the six-coordinate platinum Br2Cl4 molecule. The reason that we're using these two is that they have identical symmetries. Both have the same number and type of symmetry elements. It's just that some of the symmetry operations that we're going to look at are a little bit easier to visualize with the six coordinate species. We're going to start with the platinum tetrachloride square planar molecule and looking at proper rotational axes. And what I've done is I've given you two different perspectives of this molecule so that you can more easily see how these rotations are affecting the different uh, atom positions as we go through them. So that you can see how the atom positions are changing, I'm going to label the chlorines A, B, C, and D. And I'm going to place our rotational axis in this red arrow with the counterclockwise rotational vector. We can do a 2 pi over 4 rotation. What this does is this puts A into B's place, B into C, C into D, and D into A. Because the denominator is 4 in that, this is a C4 rotation. We can take that orientation and do an additional 2 pi over 4 rotation, converting D into A's position, A into B, B into C, and C into D. This is the second C4 rotation that we've done. So we've done a C4 rotation followed by a C4 rotation. 
we can define this as a C4 squared rotation, saying that we've done two consecutive C4 rotations. This would be the same thing as if we rotated this molecule by pi radians, or 180 degrees. So this is equivalent to a C2 rotation along that rotational axis. Going from there, we can do an additional C4 rotation, so an additional rotation by 2 pi over 4 radians. So we've now done three consecutive C4 rotations. This is a C4 cubed rotation. You can do an additional C4 rotation that brings us back to the original starting point in the molecule. That's a C4 to the fourth rotation, which is equal to a C2 squared rotation, which is equal to a C1 rotation, a rotation by 360 degrees, or 2 pi. This is the equivalent of that identity operation E. That identity operation takes precedent over a C1 operation, or a C2 squared, or a C4 to the fourth. So it's just labeled E. In addition to this rotational axis, there's other rotational axes that are found within the molecule. So we're going to look at this by staring straight down that rotational axis. That particular CN axis, that C4 axis, is our highest order or our principal rotational axis. The rotational axis that has the largest value n in the CN designation is referred to as the highest order or principal rotational axis. So that C4 axis is our principal rotational axis. All of the other rotational axes in this molecule are perpendicular to that highest order rotational axis. So for example, there's a rotational axis that goes through the B and the D chlorine atoms. You can do a 2 pi over 2 rotation, meaning that that's a C2 rotational axis. Because that rotational axis is mathematically distinct from the C2 axis that lies along the highest order rotational axis, we give that a special designation. We call that a C2 prime because it's distinct from the other C2 rotational axis. There's another rotational axis that's related to that C2 prime. It goes along the C and the A chlorine atoms and interconverts B and D. That's also a C2 prime rotational axis. In addition to those two rotational axes, there's two more. One will interconvert A and B and C and D. That's also a C2 rotational axis because it's a 2 pi over 2 rotation, but it's mathematically distinct from both the C2 and the C2 primes, so we just call it a C2 double prime. There is a second one that goes and interconverts C and B and A and D, and that's also a C2 double prime rotational axis. For those who are curious, there will be a future video on how we can mathematically define these rotational axes and other symmetry elements um, using matrices. Moving on from these proper rotations, we're going to talk about reflections through a mirror plane, so these sigma reflections. And we're going to use the six coordinate platinum species for this because it has axial bromine so that we can distinguish between axial positions. I'm going to label these like I did for the platinum tetrachloride, just labeling the bromines E and F. It has an identical C4 rotational axis as this primary or principal or highest order rotational axis, and we can define a mirror plane that's perpendicular to that. So this mirror plane will reflect F and E with one another and keep A, B, and C, a, B, C and D in the same plane, unmoved. Because this is a mirror plane that's perpendicular to the highest order rotational axis, that C4 axis, it's a sigma H. The square planar platinum tetrachloride also has that sigma H. It's a little bit more difficult to see because you're reflecting nothing. But you're, even though you're reflecting nothing, you're still doing that reflection. There are other mirror planes, so we're going to look at mirror planes that contain that rotational axis. So for example, there's a mirror plane that, by, that goes through 
CNA, it contains that C4 rotational axis, and it'll reflect B and D. We call that a sigma V. Uh, remember that both the sigma V and the sigma D contain that highest order rotational axis. You might remember that we just did an operation that looks very similar to this sigma V. It was one of the C2 primes. This is a distinct operation from the sigma V. So the sigma V and the C2 prime are not the same operation. They're different from one another. Remember that that sigma V is in that plane. It's only going to reflect through that plane. The C2 prime, on the other hand, rotates. So the axial positions will rotate. This is a little bit easier to see in that six coordinate compound, where here it's that C4 axis. We can put in that near plane that's going to reflect B and D, just like we did above. The sigma V reflects B and D, keeping A, E, C, and F in the same place. The C2 rotation, on the other hand, will flip E and F and change those places in addition to B and D. So these are distinct symmetry operations from one another. So going back, we have that sigma V that's reflecting B and D. There's another sigma V that's 90 degrees to that that will now reflect A and C, convert those two. There are two more mirror planes. These mirror planes will bisect the various chlorine, platinum, chlorine angles. One will interconvert A and B and C and D. Doing that reflection gives us this. Because this is reflecting dihedral planes, this is a sigma D. It's distinct from those sigma Vs. And there's another sigma D that's rotated 90 degrees from that original sigma D. Moving on, we're now going to talk about the inversion operation. The inversion operation operates through a central point in the molecule, the point that defines the point group. So there's our point. It's on the platinum atom. And what this does is it takes all points x, y, and z and converts them to minus x, minus y, and minus z. So doing an inversion on this six-coordinate platinum species results in this. A and C interconvert, D and B interconvert, and F and E interconvert. Just as with the horizontal mirror plane, there's also an inversion center in the square plane or platinum tetrachloride. It's just that those vacant positions are interconverting. There's nothing there, but you can still have a conversion and get the same molecule out. We're now going to discuss this improper rotation. As I said, the improper rotation is often difficult to see because it's a combination of two different symmetry operations. It's a CN followed by a sigma H, and that gives you your overall improper rotation. So taking the six coordinate platinum species, we're going to define our C4 rotational axis. And we're going to convert that C4 rotational axis into an S4 rotational axis. We do this by first performing that C4 rotation. So A goes to B, B goes to C, C goes to D, and D goes to A. Now what we do is we do a reflection through the mirror plane that's perpendicular to that C4 rotation. So we do that sigma H, and E and F have now interconverted. Those two operations, the C4 followed by the sigma H, is an overall S4 rotation, so that improper rotation. The S4 is just the C4 times the sigma H. There's another S4 rotation in this molecule. It's a C4 cubed, so three consecutive C4 rotations resulting in this orientation of the molecule, followed by the sigma H, interconverting E and F, which gives you your S4 cubed rotation. The S4 cubed is equal to the C4 cubed times the sigma H. Because these improper rotations are a bit difficult to see, I'm going to do one more improper rotation, an improper rotation on the molecule methane, so CH4. CH4 is a tetrahedral molecule, and it has an S4 rotational axis. This S4 rotational axis is aligned along the C2 rotational axis that I have depicted here. You do the C2 rotation, 
A and B interconvert, and C and D interconvert. There's an S4 rotation. So this S4 is along the same rotational axis. If we do first the C4, then we have A and B and C and D all going to positions that don't map onto the original molecule. So there is no C4 rotate symmetry element in this molecule. If we do the C4, however, followed by a reflection through a mirror plane, we do get something that looks like the same out molecule out. Overall, this is an improper rotation. It's an S4 rotation, which is the C4 followed by the sigma H. Coming up in the next video, what we're going to do is we're going to take all of these different symmetry elements and group them together so that we can assign point groups to molecules.